I'd like to call this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. Can I have a motion for closed session to certify closed session, please? I certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, the Williamsburg James City County School Board, while in closed session, discussed only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law and that only such matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All right, it's been moved and seconded. Ms. Sosa, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Serza. Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Beers. Aye. Here. Ms. Hummel. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Ms. Ownby. Here. Mrs. Taylor. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Ms. Cook. Here. Okay. May I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? Madam Chair, I move approval of the agenda as presented this evening. Second. Second. Is there any discussion? Before we take a vote, I'd just like to make a note that um, tonight's meeting is unusual in that um, we have several information action agenda items that we will discuss during the meeting and then uh, discuss later on in the meeting. Uh, and, uh, they're slated for action. So it's not typical for us to discuss and, and vote on items in the same meeting. But because we have one meeting in July, that's what we're going to do. Uh, Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Ownby. Aye. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. The agenda is approved. That brings us to 4.01 announcements and superintendent's report. Dr. Heron. Good evening, Madam Chair. It's my pleasure to introduce some of our newly appointed WJCC leaders this evening. First, Dr. Corey Murphy is joining us as Chief of Staff. Dr. Murphy comes to us from South Carolina where he served for 10 years as a successful high school principal, most recently leading Buford High School. He also brings experience from his military background in leadership, systems integration, human resources management, emergency management and communications. Dr. Murphy will supervise internal and external communications, strategic planning, policy development, and assume some of the former duties of the Deputy Superintendent. Welcome, Dr. Murphy. <laughs> Dr. Mark Hudson, if you would stand, please. Dr. Hudson is the new Warhill High School principal. Dr. Hudson comes to us from Hampton City Public Schools with 13 years experience as a principal at elementary, middle, and high school. Most recently, he served for two years as principal of Phoebus High School. Welcome, Dr. Hudson, to WJCC. <laughs> Mr. Panayotis uh, Chigaritas is the new principal at Berkeley Middle School. He comes to us from Charles City County Schools, where he served as principal of Charles City Middle and High School for two years. Prior to that, he was assistant principal in Denby High and York County Schools for seven years. Welcome, Mr. Chikoritas, into your new leadership role. <laughs> Mr. Tyrone Ty Harris is the principal of James Blair, Blair Middle School, uh, scheduled to open next year. Mr. Harris served for the last two years as middle school principal in Falls Church City Public Schools. Prior to that, he served as assistant principal, and for four years, he was a program officer for the State Department of Education, working with challenging schools across the nation. Welcome to WJCC, Mr. Harris. <laughs> Mrs. Amy Gulick is the new Bright Beginnings principal. Ms. Gulick has a strong background in early childhood education and special education, and most recently served as Special Education Instructional Specialist for WJCC. Congratulations, Ms. Gulick, on your promotion to this leadership role within WJCC. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Those are all of the announcements this evening. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Are there any announcements from school board members? Okay. If not, we'll move to citizens' comments. Um, Ms. Hummel. 
Uh, this is the time when citizens who have submitted speaker cards are invited to address the board. Speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called, state their name for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. Each speaker is allocated three minutes and time cannot be yielded to another speaker. Personnel matters are not discussed in open school board meetings and we ask that you refrain from making reference to specific individuals. The board is interested in hearing all comments fully and requests that citizens refrain from verbal outbursts, applause, or any other type of demonstration. Although the board does not respond to comments at this time, please know that we are listening and we appreciate your time. Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. Madam Chair, my directions are concluded. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Mrs. Terry, will you tell us how many cards we have today? We have 14 individuals who want to speak with us. A couple of difficult names, so bear with me um, as I call those out. We'll start with Stacy Kern Shearer. Hello, good evening. My name is Stacey kern -Shear. I'm a resident of Williamsburg City and a mother. First, I want to thank you for your service to the community and for the opportunity to address you this evening. I am here to join those of my neighbors, colleagues, and friends who have spoken and who will speak to you about prioritizing socioeconomic diversity in redistricting. Ensuring diversity in our schools benefits all of our children, and I want to highlight one specific angle of this benefit. Diverse classrooms are critical components of preparing our children for work and leadership in today's global economy. There is a growing body of solid evidence that colleges and employers highly value those students and employees who demonstrate the ability to work with diverse groups of people. In fact, in one survey, 318 major employers cited that one of the most important priorities when looking at potential employees is, the, is that the candidate is, quote, comfortable working with colleagues, customers, and or clients from diverse cultural backgrounds. Also, global leader, leaders in the business sector, including representatives of Fortune 100 companies such as Apple, Starbucks, and Johnson & Johnson, express strong support of racial diversity and learning environments by filing a friend of the court brief into the Supreme Court in a recent affirmative action case calling cross-cultural skills a, quote, business and economic imperative, end quote. So why is this? Well, because many different perspectives and experiences are present in diverse learning environments, these environments instill and reinforce strong problem solving and collaboration skills among students. And these are the exact skills that employers say are critical to success in today's business and economic culture. On a personal, on a personal note, as a lawyer who has worked in a nonpartisan capacity on Capitol Hill for nearly a decade, I have firsthand experience with working for and with people from various perspectives and with perspectives that may differ from my own. I have no doubt that my public school education and the diversity of students I learned with every day helped me develop the listening, empathy, and problem-solving skills I needed to succeed in that role and in my current job teaching at William Mary Law. I am deeply grateful for it. Our children will be entering a workforce and a national and global economy that are more diverse than any time in history. There, the more we can do in our community to instill our children from a young age, the value of listening to, talking with, and working with peers with diverse experiences and perspectives, the more we can help them develop critical life skills that will one day serve them well when competing in the national and globalized employment market. Thank you. Thank you. Beth Chambers. Hi, I'm Beth Chambers. I live in the city. And um, who's this? Are you the one who's okay? Um, I came to um, just thank you for what you're doing. I know it's a big responsibility, what you guys have. And um, when we first were looking, uh, moving, we moved here looking at real estate agents, the person said, you know, I said, which is the good, best school district? And they said, they're all good. And I really believe that person, the real estate agent at the time, they didn't have computer internet sites that are as nearly as sophisticated about real estate then. And so I just want to, I'm also, support of diversity and I want you guys to judge yourselves by the, um, but I looked on, online, it's interesting, now you go to Zillow and they rate all of our schools. I don't know if you know that. Greatschools.org rates all the schools. You look at a house and you can look at the ratings. And it's no longer true, I think, about Williamsburg that all the schools are, are the same, but it didn't matter. And property values are important. And property values are affected by good schools, and it affects how much money you guys have to use for the schools, and it affects everybody. It's kind of a proxy, I think, for um, having a good 
all good schools should be excellent. We want them all high. And I think in the past couple of redistricting episodes, they have focused on making one really good school. And I really could be very bad if you have feeder schools into one very good school. And so, yeah, you get some really good, maybe statewide or even national wide, you know, reputation for that one school. But I think you should not judge yourself based on that. You should judge your success based on every school having the highest rating. I would rather have all of the school, every any house that you go to look in, the schools are excellent. And right now that's not the case. It's, there's a lot of um, inequality in the schools. And I think every kid, every household, no matter if it's high property value or low property value, needs a good school. So use that as a rating. Um, I'd like to ask the audience to please refrain from applause. Thank you. All right, Julie King. Good evening. I'm Julie King. I'm a retired high school teacher, so education issues are always very important to me. I'm here today to encourage the board uh, that when you redistrict, you come up to the redistricting, that we do both the middle schools and the high schools at the same time. And there are a couple of good reasons for that. First of all, the monetary issue. Um, as was reported, if we do the middle schools only, it's 82,000 uh, and change. If we do the middle schools and the high schools together, it's a little over 96,000. That would be a cost saving to do both of those. I know you have budgeted $150,000, so it seems to me we should use that money and do both levels at the same time. Part of the reason we should do the high schools is because we know that we have an overcrowding problem, particularly in Jamestown. It's 112% at capacity right now, which strains all of the resources of that school. Others, other of our high schools are nearing full capacity, 88%, for instance. There was some mention earlier that we could solve this problem by installing mobile classrooms at Jamestown. Now, I personally have taught at a school that used mobile classrooms, and it's not a good idea for several reasons. First of all, uh, school boards like yourself think that it's a temporary fix. But the problem with that is, pretty soon, you're repairing the roofs, you're adding things to it, you're fixing the floors, and it's easy that 25 or 30 years go by, and you're still using those mobile classrooms. I taught at a school myself that intended to just have 10 or 12 years in the, in the uh, mobile classrooms, and they were going on 27 years. It's never temporary, even though we intend it to be. Problems with mobile classrooms incur in, um, include there's no access to restroom facilities. It's far to go to the library, the computer lab, or the cafeteria. Also, Students have to go from a building that is either warm or cool, depending on the time of year, outside, and then into the mobile classroom. There's no facilities in the mobile classroom for lockers. So therefore, you have coats and jackets and umbrellas if it's raining, um, piling up in the corner. WJCC students deserve access to the very best facilities. We should accomplish this now by redistricting both the middle schools and the high schools and not adding temporary classrooms. Thank you. Harmony Dalglish. Hello, my name is Harmony Dalglish. I live in the city. Um, so later today, you'll be considering uh, hiring the consulting firm to assist with redistricting. I want to echo some of the comments um, that Ms. King said that uh, economically it makes sense to redistrict both the middle schools and the high schools at the same time. We can spend a little bit more money now, money that we've already allocated, and address overcrowding issues at the high schools and not just kick that problem further down. Uh, I think secondly, it also creates another opportunity. So personally, I feel um, that our society is becoming too, too divided. And unfortunately, this is reflected in our middle schools and in our high schools. If you consider just a single metric economic disadvantage, 47% of students fall in this category at Berkeley, but only 17 at Hornsby. 
The high schools aren't much better, with 36 at Lafayette and only 19% at Jamestown. Redistricting offers us an opportunity to counteract these divisions. I believe our schools should be a place that brings our communities together. Redistricting to maximize socioeconomic and racial diversity in all of our schools is not going to solve all of our problems, but it's an important step that can help us bring, build a strong community. Research shows that when children experience more diverse classrooms, it increases civic engagement by those students. My children, your children, all of our students, and all of us will benefit from this. So redistricting both the middle and high schools together, it makes economic sense. And it's also an opportunity to foster civic engagement in our students by making diversity a high priority criterion in redistricting decisions. Thank you. Wendy Musin. Good evening. Uh, my name is Wendy Mustamechi. I'm a resident of James City County and a parent and mother as well. Um, I would like to thank the chair of the board, um, the board members, the school division, the superintendent for providing us with an opportunity to speak. I am likely going to echo a little bit of what um, some of the other participants have said this evening. Um, what I would like to note is that I support what they've said um, and note that diversity must be one of the top objectives of the redistricting process to ensure equitable access to high-performing schools and reduce any disproportionate effects of disadvantaged students. By way of example, Henrico County recently underwent a redistricting process that included the goal of reducing the concentration of poverty at some of schools. Additionally, I ask that the school board and or the um, school division provide information to the public on how the criteria for redistricting will be developed, when the criteria will be finalized, and how the community will be consulted during this particular stage of the process. It is important that the criteria used reflect the values of Williamsburg, James City County, and be specific to the needs, desires, and goals that are shared by this community. We would like an opportunity to provide input and engage with the process before the criteria are selected, particularly given the quick timeline for the redistricting. And finally, I would like to encourage the school board to vote to approve option two as recommended by the superintendent, Redistricting both the middle and high schools at a cost of $96,625 is substantially less than that proposed redistricting budget of $150,000. Including the high schools now will only increase the overall cost by $14,420 and makes both practical and economic sense. If Jamestown High School already exceeds capacity and enrollment throughout the division is expected to increase, then dealing with attendance boundaries now is better than continuing to apply band-aids in the form of temporary classrooms, alternative schedules, and other similar measures. I thank you again for the opportunity to speak this evening and thank you for the hard work that you all do to make our schools as great as they are. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Willem. Dr. Heron, members of the school board. My name is Kathy Woolham, and I'm here tonight to simply ask that you consider including high schools in the upcoming redistricting, really for all the reasons that previous speakers have mentioned, um, as well as others that uh, you are likely aware of. About nine years ago, when my family returned to Williamsburg, we were looking for our home, and in, as part of that process, I actually called the school board offices and was looking for insight into quality of schools. And the guidance I got at the time, I thought was very good. And it was two things. Number one, you can't go wrong in Williamsburg, James City County schools. And number two, choose your home based on where you want to live. Because of the growth in our community, the school redistricting maps will change frequently. And so for the last nine years, I have lived under that expectation. And I think many of us in a growing community do. Um, many people here tonight, I think, are here to support high school redistricting being included. Several probably didn't fill out a card. You're probably grateful for that so we can all get home at a certain time. 
but perhaps it would be helpful if those who would like to see high school redistricting included stood. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much for your time and, um, and truly for your courage in facing this. It won't be easy and we recognize that. So we appreciate all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Christy Hughes. Hi, good evening. My name is Christy Hughes. I live in James City County and I appreciate the time and the opportunity to speak with you guys tonight. I want to again just kind of echo everything that the speakers before me have commented on. Um, 100 percent when we were looking for our home in Williamsburg five years ago we specifically were avoiding several neighborhoods because of the schools because of the community feedback and I gotta say we ended up purchasing a home in one of the school districts that we did not want to be in and now that I'm there I love these kids that my son is going to school with and I have three boys they're five years apart so I have one that's going to kindergarten one that is finishing elementary school and will be next school year going into middle and I have a high schooler so you guys are going to see a lot of my face for a really <laughs> long time so let's make this good the people in our community are phenomenal and the kids are phenomenal regardless of their income and their household and who they're being raised by these kids deserve so much more and we are not living in a poor community there may be some communities within our community that are under the poverty level, but this is a very wealthy community. And I don't know what you guys think about it, but to quote the Bible, the word of God says that you have not because you ask not. We have money here. If funding is an issue, ask. Let's get the funds. Let's make this a phenomenal redistricted equal school system so nobody looking to move to Williamsburg has to consider which neighborhoods are feeding into which schools and are their kids going to be okay are their kids going to be bullied because they're going to be a minority we have wonderful resources available to us let's tap into that let's be smart with our money and like Julie King said about the redistricting costs and the fact that we have the money set aside already let's tap into that ninety six thousand dollars to do both sounds really good to me and it just makes sense on paper and being a business person I don't understand why we would not um, the equality is definitely there's a glaring inequality in our high schools unacceptable unacceptable the middle schools were working on resolving that okay well great but why are any of these families having to go through these things these are very easily resolved problems and as far as the facilities yeah we need to put some money into some of the facilities because there is a huge huge I mean just driving by safety is an issue we've got the aesthetics the athletic fields all of our kids deserve the opportunities we have athletes we have scholars we have people that are coming through our school systems that are going out into the world and doing great things so let's make it fair for everyone and redistrict the high schools as well thank you thank you Lisa Stoddard My name is Lisa Stoddard. I'm a James City County resident, and I have two children uh, starting in the fall that will be at Lafayette High School. So tonight, um, I'm representing uh, myself, but also Bambi Walters, who is the Lafayette High School PTSA president, and I represent as a board member as secretary. So I'm going to read um, some information and some uh, guidelines that Bambi had uh, emailed to everyone at the table earlier. So I'm just going to review some of those. Okay. So I serve as the Lafayette High School PTSA secretary. Our PTSA president, Bambi Walters, who lives at 5112 Shoreline Court, could not attend tonight, but asked me to read a short statement requesting that you consider including high school redistricting with the middle school redistricting. PTSA's mission is to make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children to secure the highest advantages in physical, mental, social, and spiritual education. As our community prepares for the redistricting of the middle schools, we understand that the school board is likely to vote tonight or in the near future 
on whether to include high school redistricting with the middle schools. Accordingly, we ask that you consider the following. The current system-wide enrollment and capacity of our high schools show that Jamestown is at 112%, Warhill 91%, and Lafayette 88%. In addition, some of the communities for Jamestown and Warhill have projected growth of approximately 1% to 3% per year, while Lafayette's projected growth is significantly less because of the majority of our communities are near fully developed. Looking at these current enrollment levels at 112, 91, and 88 show that the high school populations are significantly imbalanced. And while it seems that redistricting would help ensure that every student is provided essential resources to succeed and avoid overcrowding, we recognize that redistricting is challenging. Accordingly, a survey was sent to our Lafayette PTSA membership and community members in the last few days. As of Tuesday afternoon today, we had 291 responses, with 224 of those in the Lafayette District and 67 outside of the Lafayette District. We had 182 parents, 27 students, 25 teachers or faculty or staff, 31 community members, three others, and 23 that did not answer that particular question. But of the respondents, um, when they were asked whether to include redistricting, 53% wanted the school board to include high school redistricting. 32 did not, and 15% were still undecided. More important, responders answered reasons as to why they supported or opposed redistricting. And I'm gonna note the top four reasons. Okay, sorry. So you have this in your email, so we hope that you review the next four reasons, and uh, we hope that you do include redistricting in this round. Thank you. Thank you. Salvatore Saperino. Thank you. <laughs> for allowing me to speak. Um, what I want to say is that I feel fortunate to live in James City County um, because of the diversity of the entire community, um, which is reflected to some extent in our current school attendance zones, but not necessarily in our schools. So I'd like to um, suggest that when the school board works with the consultant that they develop a series of criteria ahead of time that uh, requires the consultant to present, I think they're going to present three plans, three attendance zone plans, and each of those plans should um, meet the criteria that the school board sets out. And the members of the community, so far as I've heard today, have suggested that each of those attendance zones be economically diverse, balanced, reflect the entire community. And that should not be very difficult to achieve because the diversity of the, the, the residential diversity of the community is such that you could probably draw any set of boundaries and achieve diversity within those zones. It's not very difficult. How do I know this? Um, I um, work at the College of William and Mary, and my specialty is school attendance zones. I've collected them <laughs> um, and economic segregation. So I can mathematically demonstrate to you what it is that I'm saying in a very simple kind of way, that we're diverse. Um, we live shoulder to shoulder with people from all, all walks of life, and the schools could probably achieve that pretty simply if, they're, if the design of the zones is thought out carefully. Thank you. Thank you. E. Clark. Hello, um, my name is Amy Quirk. I live in the city of Williamsburg. I'm a parent, also a professor at William and Mary. And I want to join tonight my friends at the village and other organizations in their comments on redistricting. Um, we've noted in the RFP uh, that the consulting firms will be charged with the task of coming up with um, or helping develop some of the criteria um, for the school attendance zones. Um, and I would just ask the school board if they could provide us with information on how that criteria is going to be developed, when it's going to be finalized, and um, how community input will, um, will be um, collected at this key stage, um, particularly before the maps are already drawn. I think communicating the criteria for redistricting means communicating our community's values um, to the consulting firm so they know what to prioritize when they go about uh, making the maps. Um, now, I think we can all agree that one thing that we value is good schools, um, but what makes a good school? 
When I think of a good school, I think of a school um, that offers challenging, creative environments, places that make teachers want to innovate, uh, try new things, places that make students want to learn. Um, these are schools that create a strong sense of school pride. Teachers and students are proud of their school. They're proud of the important work that they are doing together. So how can redistricting help us build good schools with these qualities? Um, I think it can do so in two ways. Um, first, great schools aren't overcrowded. Um, as many people have noted, Jamestown is overcrowded. Um, so I think that um, dealing with the high school redistricting uh, allows us to meet these twin goals of reducing overcrowding and maintaining fiscal responsibility. Um, second, we need to redraw our school attendance boundaries so that the rich diversity of our community is reflected equally in each school, as others have mentioned. Um, the social science research on diversity of, um, suggests that diverse student bodies, student bodies that are racially, um, ethnically, and socioeconomically economically diverse, are the richest learning environments um, because students learn the most from um, others that are the most different from them in their experiences in their outlooks. Um, research also shows that diverse learning environments increase student motivation um, and increases their intellectual self-confidence uh, because students become adept at evaluating different experiences and different perspectives that are, um, that are distinct from their own. Um, again, a critical skill in, in the current globe mar um, global job market. Um, so we are already this richly diverse community that can foster this type of learning. We have racial diversity, we have economic diversity, we have English learners, um, we have students with disabilities. We need each of our schools to reflect this diversity um, such that we can ensure that each school and all the teachers have the funds that they need to engage students' diverse lived experiences such that it enhances everyone's education. Um, so I think these are the values that we want to um, prioritize in redistricting. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Vickham Mendez. Good evening. Um, thank you for this opportunity to address you. My name is Jennifer Vickham Mendez. I live in James City County, and I'm a parent, and um, I'm also a faculty member at the college. Um, I'd like to add my voice uh, to the chorus. Um, Many of uh, my points have been uh, made by the concerned residents and um, uh, my, my colleagues and friends at the village. Um, I also want to um, urge this, the school board to establish diversity as a primary criterion as the division moves forward with redistricting. Um, my uh, colleagues and um, other residents who have spoken before me have already pointed out the benefits of diversity to learning environments. Um, and. Uh, and I think you know, this is increasingly important as the United States moves to becoming a majority minority country in the next 30 years. Um, but um, I guess the point I want to make is what do we mean by diversity? And I would ask the school board to approach this question thoughtfully and to attend to making use of the best data and information available to project school compositions. Um, we also urge the school board to provide the public with clear information about the projected school compositions for all the proposed redistricting maps. That is, it, that is, it is important to go beyond establishing diversity as a criterion. Diversity must be carefully and thoughtfully defined. Eligibility for reduced school lunch, while important, is just one metric. We also feel it is important to use, again, the best available data to capture changes in our community. And um, I, for one, am particularly um, interested and, I guess, concerned with the English language um, learners. Um, as a scholar of immigration, um, I can attest to the limitations of, um, of census data in trying to capture immigrant populations uh, at the local level. And I urge the school district to think very carefully and to look at enrollment numbers from the schools as opposed to um, numbers that might be a, a bit outdated because things are happening very fast. Um, I've been volunteering. This past year, I volunteered in an um, English language learner in an ESL classroom at Lafayette High School, and it was a pleasure to do so with my students. But one thing that we very quickly noticed was just how quickly the numbers were rising. Um, and of course, Lafayette High School was receiving all the English language learners from all of the high schools. Um, high concentrations of English language learners in one school has implications for staffing, particularly when it comes to guidance counselors. And this is an issue that I really wanted to highlight to the board. To be in compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, effective counseling in a language that students can understand must be provided. 
And in the absence of counselors proficient in the student's language of origin, that means bringing in a trained interpreter, not another teacher, um, according to the statutes as I understand it of Title VI, um, but someone who's trained to, in, uh, to, to interpret um, and isn't just simply bilingual but knows how to interpret um, for the guidance counselors. This implies a cost. So that's just one of my points. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak before you. Thank you. Jessica Carter. Hello, my name is Jessica Carter. I am a mother of three students um, in Williamsburg James City County Schools. I'm a resident and I'm also a member of the Village Initiative Corporation. Um, I would like to address the issue of diversity as well. Um, also the overpopulation of students, the lack of availability of an appropriate, appropriate education. The schools, as we've already heard tonight, are overcrowded. Um, Jamestown and Berkeley cannot possibly offer an appropriate education to our students when they're 100 to 12 to 120 percent overpopulated. Um, the staff are being pulled from all different departments um, when our special education staff is already um, way understaffed. Their staff is being pulled from one-to-one -one mandated accommodations and being placed in classrooms of 30 plus students to assist general um, education teachers. Um, this puts our schools way beyond non-compliance with our special education. Um, the ratio of 21 to 1 in our classrooms has gone out of the window and our children's educational needs are being neglected. Uh, our staffing as far as diversity and the available staff are a big problem that needs immediate attention. Thank you. Thank you. Jacqueline Bridgeforth Williams. Good evening, ma Madam Chair and ladies and gentlemen of the board. I'm Jacqueline Bridgeforth Williams, founder of the Village Initiative Incorporated. Thank you for this opportunity this evening to speak with you. I would also like to thank all of Williamsburg James City County's teachers, administrators, coaches, and staff for your commitment to providing the children of this community with a quality education. I am sure <clears throat> Some people will have already come forward tonight with a lot of studies and concerns about the upcoming redistricting as parents and members of the community. I am here to address redistricting as it relates to the mission of the village. In keeping with our mission, we are here to be part of the process through advocating for equity, diversity, and lowering of the achievement gap in our schools as we embark on the process of redistricting. We are hoping to continue with an open and transparent process of redistricting to include everyone. We would like to have a clear understanding of the criteria used for the upcoming redistricting. We strive to maintain schools that are reflective of our community, which is rich in diversity and culture. We want to work in partnership with our schools and our community to prepare every student for a life beyond the classroom in a diverse society, in our colleges, and in our workforce. Thank you again to Williamsburg James City County Schools. We will continue our work for our youth by advocating for our families, our youth, and building programs. We are asking that our school system take a closer look at the advantages of hiring more teachers of color, building programs, and addressing the achievement gap. We hope to raise the achievement gap of uh, the achievement of all students. The Village Initiative appreciates the support from the board members. We thank you again for attending our meetings. <clears throat> and at this time, we would like to extend an invitation to meet with us to discuss the criteria for the upcoming redistricting. Thank you, and we hope to meet with you all again soon. And we would especially like to thank you all for allowing us to build our mentoring programs and to partner with Williamsburg James City County Schools. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair. Good evening, board members. My name is Adrienne Carter. <clears throat> Excuse me, I am a longtime resident here in Williamsburg. I'm a product of the James City County Public School System. I finished Lafayette back in 1982 when it was the only high school in Williamsburg, James City County. Um, I am a parent of a, a, a son who will be a freshman at Jamestown High School. He has a um, IEP, 
and Jamestown High School was 112% overpopulation, and I'm concerned about him getting an equitable and quality education in that environment based on the way the school is structured at this time. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, chances are you're probably seeing me during the course of the next four years as well. I just want to um, encourage you as you go through the redistricting process, I certainly concur with the others who have spoken before, recognizing their concerns that the middle school and the high school should both be considered during the redistricting process. Uh, in addition, I'd like to welcome the new personnel to the school district as well. And I'd like to say that I'm eager to engage with policy changes towards creating more diverse representation in the classrooms in an effort to reduce the achievement gap here in James City County. So it's great to see the new personnel. I like to see that representation in the, in the, in the classrooms as well. I want to reemphasize that. One other thing I'd like to mention is, if I'm not mistaken, I think that James Blair, I'm sorry, Berkeley Middle School is going to be slated as the ESL hub for the county, for the, for the school district. Is that not the case? Please forgive me if it's not, but I'd like to mention that if, in fact, there is going to be an ESL hub in James City County School, that it be done at the newly revamped James Blair, James Blair Middle School. Thank you. Thank you. Those are all our speaker votes. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. <clears throat> that brings us to item 6.01, which is the VSBA delegate and alternate delegate. Um, typically, um, that those roles fall to the chair and the vice chair, but Mrs. Taylor will not be attending the VSBA conference in November, and therefore um, uh, Ms. Hummel has graciously agreed to uh, serve as the alternate. So um, if anyone has any questions about that, we'd be happy to answer them. Mr. Kelly? <coughs> Just buff up mm -hmm. on your parliamentary procedure, because it is beyond. At the, at the VSBA delegate assembly. Oh, is it? Yeah. Do I need to bring a, well, okay. No, they'll take care of you, don't yeah. worry. So you're on. Uh, I'm the parliamentarian, so I better yeah, bring my Robert's better, rules. Yeah, bring your order. Robert's rules. <laughs> okay. All right, anything else? Okay. That brings us to item 6.02, authorization of signatures in absence of the superintendent. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Annually, we bring uh, to you uh, uh, to ask for your approval of the authorization of people to sign uh, things when I'm not uh, in, in the system. And I'm asking you to approve or to consider the authorization of Ms. Christina Bird, a Chief Financial Officer, Dr. Jeffrey Carroll, Assistant Superintendent, Mr. Scott Thorpe, Assistant Superintendent, to sign State Department of Education documents in my absence. Any questions for Dr. Heron? That brings us to item 6.03, tuition rates for non-resident students for 2017-2018 school year. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, annually, again, we look at the tuition rates for non-resident students, and Ms. Bird, a Chief Financial Officer, is here to present this agenda item tonight. Thank you. Good evening, Thanks. Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. Annually, we're required to bring to you the tuition um, non-resident tuition rates for the upcoming school year based on the 2018 budget. Based on this, um, the 2018 budget, the regular education tuition rate is recommended to be $9,832, which is an increase of $209 or 2.1% over fiscal year 17. Special education rate for non-resident tuitions is proposed to be $17,895 or an increase of $54 or 0.3%. This calculation follows the methodology that has been used in prior years to calculate this non-resident cost to attend Williamsburg James City County Schools. In fiscal year 17, we had two students, uh, regular education students, that attended and paid tuition. Two. At, at what level? Uh, regular ed, regular uh, ed. Elementary, middle? I believe one was high school and one was middle. Um, in light of the overcrowded situation that we have here, are there restrictions placed on if a school is overcrowded, for example, people who are paying out of district costs? I'm fairly certain they follow the same process with Ms. Bourgeois' department um, and go through that, and we do consider them similar to out-of-zone transfers. Yes, and those would be limited to those, if a school is overcrowded, those schools would not be open to the, the zoning process. Any other question about tuition rates? Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Berta. 
That brings us to item 6.04, revised policy JN, Appendix A student fee schedule. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Annually, we bring to you Appendix A attached to, to policy JN that actually looks at student fees for the upcoming year. And uh, Mr. Paul is here to speak to this this evening. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. This item comes to you every year as an update to student fees, fees for this coming school year. Upon your adoption of these fees this evening, we will change this draft to reflect the approved 2017-18 um, student fee schedule. I'm just going to highlight for you right now some changes from last year's schedule. Fees for world language workbooks at the middle school level have been eliminated. With the expansion of the one-to-one -one laptop program, this content is now available digitally and hard copies of workbooks are no longer needed. Also, um, in some other world language classes, we have eliminated the need for workbooks because of curriculum resource changes, as well as increased online um, and primary sources. There are no increases in athletic fees, parking, and other academic courses. Questions? Why is German the why is German and French there are charges for that, but not the other? Latin and the teachers of each of those languages, if they can find um, rich resources that are digital, then they choose not to use a, an actual hard copy workbook. Um, we are encouraging teachers to go out more and more and look for primary sources and online sources. And as we continue our curriculum development in world languages, we're hoping to eliminate more and more fees in that area. So since like you, you had last year's fees, and there's no last year's fees for German and French. Does that mean that there weren't any fees for German and French last year? Am I? The fees are the same. So no change. No change. So it's all in red. It's, so it should be no change for 20? No change. You see what I mean? Yeah. It, it should all say no yeah, change. The other ones are in black, and then in red it says no change next to it. So, so slightly different format. Got it. Thanks. Yes, Mr. Kelly. So the, um, the language workbooks, the $20, but it changes to zero because it's online. Is there Are there still charges for access to those online resources that are going somewhere else? They were incorporated in our uh, textbook adoption fees. And so we paid for them anyway when we adopted the textbook. So students with every single um, Spanish one middle school uh, textbook, they can go online, get the exact same resources, both audio files, digital movies, um, worksheets. That's a, that's a great thing and in in the good for our middle school students that they, we have that uh, a laptop program in middle school. Thank you. Else? Uh, just a quick question about the driver's ed. It says to be determined. Um, every year the VDOE gives us a fee. Um, they have a, a particular formula that they use based on the number of students and how much it's going to cost. And we just find that out every year. I think it's end of August, early September. And then we publish that. We have a mechanism for letting all of our driver's ed teachers and athletic directors know about that ahead of time. Anything else? That brings us to item uh, 6.05, the redistricting RFP. Um, before I toss it to Dr. Heron, and um, uh, I just want to just kind of clarify what we need from this discussion today. Uh, essentially, there are three options uh, for us later in the meeting. The first option, in no particular order, would be to, to if we're not comfortable or haven't come to a point where we're at consensus, um, we don't have to approve an RFP um, that would that would impact the timeline um, and and uh, change that uh, and so that is an option. Uh, the other option would be to adopt the RFP uh, that would include the scope of work that's just the middle schools, and then uh, and then the third option would be to adopt the RFP that includes both the middle schools and the high schools. So I'm hoping that we can have a discussion today on this topic. Um, by the end of which we know later on in the meeting what our course of action will be. So anyway, with that, Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, a request for propos proposals was issued on May 18th with the due date of June 15th. 
um, was advertised appropriately and based on that we have brought to you a proposal for a vendor this evening. I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Kitty Hall, Purchasing Director from Jim City County, to maybe walk us through the process that was used uh, to select the actual vendor. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron, I'm here to answer any questions that you might have concerning what the process was for the RFP for the redistricting consultant services. Anyone have any specific questions for? Do you want to talk to us a little bit? Are you allowed to talk to us about how many responses that you got and, and what process you went through? Once we you received, received three responses to the RFP. We also used a set criteria in the selection process that I know Ms. Hall has in front of her this evening as well. Do you want to talk about the, the criteria we used to select the vendor? Uh, I don't have the direct uh, criteria in front of me. We had worked with Dr. Heron and the evaluation committee to devise the criteria based on pretty much industry standards for other RFPs that had been done for redistricting and assigned the point values uh, based on what they felt were the, the items that were, were uh, most significant and would be uh, provided to interested firms so that they would know what the ranking uh, criteria would be and what the points assigned would be when we got to the point that we would be evaluating those proposals. Uh, we did get three proposals and because we received three proposals, uh, the committee felt that we would uh, move forward with uh, interviewing all three firms. Um, the audience, the gallery cannot hear. Can you can you all hear? No. Okay. Is, is there anything we can do about that? Okay. Thank you all. Sorry to interrupt. So, does anyone have any questions about the RFP process or the RFP itself, or any comments? Mr. Kelly. So with so with the, you had the three respondents, and so were they all in the same order of magnitude as far as cost and and. Uh... No, with RFP proposals, uh, generally uh, they're kind of all over the place. That's the purpose of putting the criteria in, so that you have some basis to do the review and do the analysis with the scoring. Uh, because there were only three, there wasn't a natural dividing line where you would uh, do a typical short list of firms. We just. Uh, felt like we wanted to go vet through the process with all three. Any other questions? Mr. Kelly. I do have to say that I have utmost faith in Mrs. Hall in, this, or in, in doing this. You, um, you've all, you always do a great job and, and, and it's just a, it's a pleasure working with you. Very much. I appreciate that. Very lucky to have. Yes, Dr. Beers. Uh, I have no knowledge. I was not in that position when I guess this had happened before, so they were not familiar to me. So, does anyone want to talk about what you know? What? The, the proposal itself or the scope of work and um, what, um, I guess essentially are you ready to make a decision tonight? If, if, so, if not, what inf information do you need in order to get to a decision? And if so, which of the two options um, you would prefer? Does anyone want to dive into that? So the first question is if we do not make a decision tonight, if we go to get more information, what, what effect does that have to us on the calendar? Dr. Heron, would you like to respond to that? Um, Mr. Kelly, I think it will certainly slow down the process. Uh, the whole, the whole, there has been a calendar laid out which will the vendor that I'm proposing tonight or the committee is proposing to you tonight takes us through an actual process where they work with staff, they get the data, they work with the board to form criteria. There's a whole list of process steps in it and if we don't move forward tonight it certainly will leave us more it more difficult to finish in time to get everything in place for the the re, the new zones. The original um, proposal from the uh, recommendation or information sheet, I guess I should say, from the administration that was handed to us at the April meeting suggests that we should have approved um, a contract in June. So 
right now we're in July. Um, and so if we don't act tonight, we're doing it in August. Correct. Presumably. Unless you want to meet again sometime in the next couple of weeks, right? Um, so as and so the vendor and their response, do they do they sign up for that that calendar? Yes, they're able to deliver the services in the time frame that we've proposed. Whether we do both or just one. Correct. Um, how they manage that is they add an extra day for some of the pieces. If they were doing both middle and high school, they would come on site for two days rather than one in several stages of the process. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, yes. I would say that it's definitely the will of the community that we redistrict both the middle and the high. And I know as a board, we've discussed capacity issues as well as equity issues. Um, so for me, it's kind of a no-brainer. There's not a significant cost <clears throat> in terms of the actual redistricting at both levels. I think there is a significant cost um, at multiple levels if we do not redistrict at the high, the high school level now. Else? Yeah, I, uh, to your microphone. Microphone. Yeah. yeah, I agree that uh, that we do the middle and the high school at the same time. Um, and it's not just cost saving. I think it's also um, uh, just dealing with that, that, that whole complexity of uh, um, middle schools and high schools, middle school students moving on into the high schools. And I just think it, uh, it just makes the most sense. Um, to do that now. I agree. Say that in the microphone. Yeah. I agree. I don't care. That's. I mean, it's if we if we don't do both now, then we've got um, eighty six thousand now, and then eighty six thousand presumably next year to do that. Um, the the one, the one question I have with, with Jamestown being at 112 and Warhill at 91, Lafayette at 88, the question is how much does it fix us? So if, if all three of the schools are at, they have different, different sizes, yada, 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 if all three of the schools are at 95, um, we are still, the can is still kicked down the curb a couple of years where we have to do something at a high school capacity level, whether that is build a new school, put in new um, mobile what do I, learning cottages, I think we call them now. So, I mean, so, so there's still a, 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 um, a certain element of kicking the can down the curb. But yeah, or move a program or, you know, or some, you know, there's, there's several options to, uh, to gain capacity. And, and so I am very much in favor of contracting to do both. But what I'm not certain I'm in favor of is is um, redistricting high school. I'm pretty sure I'm in favor of that, but I I, I want to understand how much time it buys us, and um, and and what it what it buys us, um, and how and more importantly how that ties directly into the CIP and other capital investments. So um, so and I think that this process will give us an opportunity to have that discussion um, before we. Um, you know, be, before we vote on a final map for um, re, for high schools, um, because attendance zones are what they are, an option is always to to keep them the same. But I, I'm fairly certain I I would like to redistrict high schools, but I think we need to hire this firm to help us help walk us through that process. Uh, I think that's the most fiscally responsible thing to do. Madam Chair, yeah. if I may, just to add to that, while I agree, um, capacity. Um, can really only change so much because quite frankly we are at capacity with all of our schools except for one which is DJ Montague however something that we can mitigate out the gate in 2018 are the equity issues that can certainly be addressed true I just want to say one thing it was highlighted tonight by uh, one of our speakers and I didn't underline which speaker but uh, she talked about the stability of, of uh, we have some communities that are very stable and they continually feed into the same school and I think uh, the, the growth isn't in that area. I think that needs to be one of the criteria considered because if we don't somehow affect change there, it's going to be continue to be the same issue. Yeah, that, that school will remain pretty much the same and the other two are going to continue to grow. 
So, um, Madam Chair, if I could address a, a previous question of Dr. Beers. Uh, Dr. Beers, you'd asked about whether a previous company was involved in, in this company. Um, there is a, a previous name, Dijon, that has been incorporated into this company. However, the process that is being proposed is entirely different to the one that was used prior. And this is a, is, it is a different company, but they are part of that bigger company now, just as a, a, matter, a point of reference. Um, so I have a couple of thoughts I'd like to, to kind of walk through and um, about um, about this as as um, if a contract is executed. Um, one of the things that isn't clear to me um, is that I just want to make sure that this each the school board members have an opportunity to talk to the consultant directly um, about their thoughts uh, on, on this on this topic as as criteria are developed. Likewise, um, I, we heard tonight pretty clearly that the criteria that we're really transparent um, about what the criteria is and that there's an opportunity for public input. So I want to be crystal clear that that process is managed in a transparent and inclusive way. Um, I also, uh, Ms. Hall, there, if you look on the document, um, the original, oh, which one? There's one, there's the price that's in board docs, which is, is it 96? But there's a different price, like 102 or so. Can you explain the difference yes, that we're seeing? Yes, I negotiated out the printing, <laughs> and we will take care of that in-house. Thank you. Can you also talk a little bit about the, the cooperative work with James City County and the resources that you're bringing to the table, like printing? Yeah. Yes, sometimes you need to be a little creative when you're going through this process and look at the resources that you have around you and in-house. And in this particular case, we have uh, a super resource with our GIS and uh, with our data and we were able to um, engage GIS personnel from from the county to assist us in sifting through some of the the uh, technical um, things that were in the proposals about what the companies would be able to do for us what we thought we could do for ourselves and be able to glean some of that information for them to be able to use uh, in the ways that they would need to present it and, and, and do the work that they needed to do. But uh, we were able to, as you can see, significantly reduce what the cost would be by using resources that were available to us in-house. That's an important partnership. Mm -hmm. And if I could add to that, uh, Ms. Hall went through line by line and negotiated on the original price and the original process is very different to what you have in front of you tonight because of using available resources. So thank you for that. Mrs. Hall is good. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then two other things that I'd like to know a little bit more about, uh, not now, but in the, in the coming months. We did hear from the public both in email and then tonight about um, considering certain factors. And one of them was about, um, you know, diversity, socioeconomic status. It would be helpful if the board understood what criteria it can and cannot use and looking so you know are we allowed to use socioeconomic status are we allowed to use race are we allowed to use ethnicity I think it's in if in being crystal clear about what is yeah, bottom know. chair built into the process with the proposed uh, company they will actually have a workshop with the board to develop the criteria with your input and so they'll present what other systems have done, they'll present what, they'll look at our policies to see if there's any, any guiding principles within those, and they will actually work with you in a public work session to develop the criteria with the board. That was purposely built in because of prior communication with the board. Um, and the other thing that we've heard um, a little bit about is the idea of um, uh, keeping neighborhoods together. And um, I would like to, um, as I uh, weigh in on that topic, I'd like to better understand um, neighborhoods. And I'll, I'll defer to you on what information is helpful to a board. I don't know if it's square miles or population or student population, but um, I think natural boundaries embedded within or man-made boundaries in the form of major roads. But what, um, but in terms of, size of neighborhoods and then um, as that because at the end of the day um, is it good public policy to allow private development to, de to determine public policy or not and then if so you know what criteria are we using to say yes or no to that 
And so I don't know whether that's working with planning departments or what, but I'd like to understand, because in some cases, n entire neighborhoods are bigger than the city of Williamsburg, right? So um, I think as, as part of the process, everything is going to be mapped. The numbers in every neighborhood are going to be on maps before they're ever presented to the public. Um, when the criteria is established, from my understanding, there's going to be an, an analysis of, of all of the data based on, on the criteria that the board set, whether it's, whether it's natural boundaries, whether it's socioeconomic status, or whatever the board eventually chooses. And so you'll have uh, maps in their, in their first form and then how the, the changes that could take place to, to meet the criteria of the board. But we'll certainly work with the county to get some preliminary information for the board so that we can and if that's something we want to prioritize or not. I don't feel like I have enough information to do that well. So, is there anything else? No? Okay. Brings us to item 6.06, .06, request for a permanent utility. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Uh, permanent utility easement to Dominion Energy at James Blair Middle School. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're asking you to consider a resolution tonight uh, regarding a permanent easement, and Mr. Snipes is here to speak to that this evening. Thank you, Mr. Snipes. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, school board members, Dr. Heron. Um, the last time I was before you for an easement was back in September, similar to this one. It is for James Blair um, Middle School. The easement request is from now, used to be Dominion Virginia Power, which is now Dominion Energy, um, to run a conduit from basically the rear of the annex here out into the front of the new James Blair. Uh, this easement request is at no cost to the school board. Um, it's about 75,000 square feet, but it's only 15 feet wide, but you're running a linear course. Questions? Sure. So, so um, what is this easement for? The easement is for Dominion Virginia, um, Dominion Energy to operate and maintain a conduit of uh, fiber and wire from the rear of the annex here out into the front of um, James Blair. They're running a conduit. They're and so they'll own that conduit? They'll own that end of that wire to, at the building? Yes. And so if there's any problems anywhere along the line, they're paying, they're paying to repair that? Yes. And they, they, come on, they are coming on site to repair it, yes. And that easement is only to support our school. It doesn't, doesn't That's correct. do anything The else. easement is only to support our school. If you, when you walk out here tonight, you look to your left, you'll see a box there, and they're running power from that box to the front of the to the front of James Blair. Is there nobody from Dominion here tonight, or are they over at Mounts Bay? Yeah, <laughs> probably at Mounts Bay. <laughs> oh, that was ugly. Yeah, that Thank was, you. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right. That brings us to item 7.01, the Pathways Project at Warhill Pilot Study Report. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're pleased this evening to bring you uh, the Pilot Study Report on the first year of, uh, of Pathways at Warhill, and Dr. Carroll will be introducing this agenda item this evening. Dr. Carroll, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school board, and Dr. Heron. I'm here tonight to... Uh, Sorry, rookie. Um, give you a, a summary and evaluation for the Pathways Project uh, for this 2016-17 school year at Warhill High School. Just to quickly give you some background again and uh, context for tonight's uh, report and the evaluation report from William and Mary. Uh, we received WJCC in partnership with William and Mary in 2015. Uh, we applied for and uh, were awarded one of five uh, high school innovation grants uh, offered by the Virginia Department of Education at that time. Uh, so we spent the 2015-16 school year in planning. And then this past year, we received an uh, implementation grant and implemented what became the Pathways Project at, at Warhill High School. During that planning year, uh, we developed uh, our goals and that as we worked, we wanted to uh, develop a program that in place of prescribed program of studies, we focused on mastery of content, not seat time, uh, that we would look at what a student has learned, not what they memorized for a test, and also that personalized learning to help a student prepare for their future, a future that's based on their interests and what they want to be. 
And our goal with that was to uh, better increase student engagement. When we implement the program this year, uh, again, as I've been before uh, you at other times this year, this is a typical schedule uh, for one of our 100 freshmen this past year at Warhill in the Pathways Project. Uh, Humanities by Design was one of our project-based uh, classes, original curriculum developed in partnership with William & Mary, double-blocked, co-taught, uh, social studies and uh, English. Uh, on a transcript, it shows up as a World History II credit and an English 9 credit for those freshmen. Then during our academic enrichment period, we developed uh, what we call Design Your On-Ramp, uh, a program where they worked on computer skills, uh, being that these students were the first time had a one-to-one -one initiative, uh, and then also did, began career exploration and job shadowing. They uh, then would participate in a blended learning class. Uh, in the fall, in this example, the student participated in Pathways English. Uh, again, competency-based, personalized, blended, uh, online content delivery, but also with a, a teacher in the classroom to help uh, deliver one-on-one, -on -one, small group, or whole group instruction. And then we left uh, space in the schedule for students to work towards other graduation requirements. Uh, in this example, the students working towards Spanish 2 in the fall, health and PE in the spring. Uh, that may be in a traditional classroom at Warhill or also in an online environment. Uh, then in this example, the student takes physics by design in the spring, our second project-based uh, course developed uh, in partnership with William & Mary. Uh, again, co-taught, double block. Uh, on a transcript, it uh, shows up for a student as physics and AFTA. AVDA is Algebraic Functions and Data Analysis, uh, one of the math credits that works towards uh, meeting the current three credit uh, require math requirement for graduation. They continued with Design Your On-Ramp uh, throughout the spring. And then they took Pathways Math, again, path, uh, math uh, at their appropriate level, whether it's Algebra 1, Geometry, or Algebra 2 in a blended learning environment. And then again, the, uh, the block for uh, pursuing other graduation requirements. Also, that extra block was there uh, to allow students who are interested in band, chorus, theater, or you know, uh, maybe one of our Project Lead the Way uh, courses at Warhill High School to pursue those options uh, outside the, the Pathways Project. Some of the assessments that our students participated in, because we looked at innovating uh, the assessment process, uh, we worked with closely at times uh, throughout the year with the Virginia Department of Education, our Humanities by Design. Uh, we piloted a locally verified credit for World History II. So uh, as part of the fact sheet that you have in front of you, uh, all 100 students uh, received a locally verif you know, a, a verified credit for graduation in World History II without participating in an SOL assessment. Uh, Pathways English, instead of the SOL assessment, uh, they took work keys writing. And then Pathways Math, they would take their uh, traditional end of course SOL math, whether it's Algebra 1, Geometry, or Algebra 2. At this time, uh, our staff, we've worked on uh, putting together a video that we uh, hope uh, can show you, summarizes some of the uh, uh, progress that we've made this year with our pilot. Pathways program to um, advance my education and kind of learn in a way that was different from the rest of education that I've been through for a majority of my life. Well the biggest reason I wanted my child to participate in the Pathways project is I knew from some of the work that I actually do in my business in the Army is that project-based learning is somewhat superior to traditional uh, rote education and um, Learning at the point of need is really the, the next step in education and I thought that that would prepare him best if he wanted to go to college and for anything else he wanted to do in his life. I wanted my daughter to come to Pathways so that she could experience a more 21st century education and how when they go to college they do things on a um, at your own pace and also too you still are held accountable for your work and has to be provided in a timely fashion. 
I like the technology. It's pretty cool. And well, I thought it would be fun and interesting and you know, something that we don't really see very often. The reason I wanted my daughter to participate in the Pathways Project was it really offered some innovative opportunities for her. Uh, it gave a lot of hands-on project-based learning um, and it was pieces at her own speed, her own pace. For me personally, why I decided to join Pathways because it was a different opportunity that I know that most other people wouldn't be able to do as freshmen in high school. With anything new, um, communication is key. Uh, while I had a basic understanding of where the program was going and what its goals were, um, I think it required clearly a two-way communication between myself as a parent uh, and the school. I think the biggest challenge she's faced is that there are, you have to be self-motivated. Uh, you can't just wait for the teacher to give it to you. You have to seek it out. You have to actively be engaged in your learning. You can go through it as fast as you'd like because uh, they do have some other work for you to do if you're already done with something. So you could start getting ahead on the next module or you can take it slow and ask questions if you actually need the teacher's help. I want to be able to challenge myself and be able to do hands-on learning. There have been some challenges for me, but now I understand what I need to do in order to turn it in and I really want my grades to improve so I need to work harder. These students thirst for knowledge. They want more challenges. They, they want as much as we can give them. And keeping up, I think, was the biggest challenge. Not just grading and the usual things that teachers have to keep up with, but truly keeping up with the things that our students can do because we truly underestimate what our students are capable of. You give them enough rope and they will climb. This semester for me uh, was history and I love doing history and we'd go more in, we'd go more in depth into the background of it and just saying okay here's this now let's keep going. I feel like I've learned a lot about having to teach collaboration skills and skills that might not necessarily be taught in a traditional classroom. Um, something that I've had to learn a lot is conferencing with students and putting students in their groups and having very individualized conversations about how to collaborate and um, communicate with one another and think critically and work together in order to um, put together a final product. I think the most exciting part for me was to really see how I've grown as a student just through this past year. Um, and meeting the teachers and the people in the program has really been something that has been great for me. I mean, uh, a lot of the teachers in this program I think I will be keep in touch with for a majority of my life. They've really helped me grow as a student. One thing that I've learned about myself that I'm able to make sure that I get things done when I need to get things done and it's more I'm independent and I learn how to be independent instead of being dependent on a teacher to get me or my parents to have to make me get stuff done. What we've really discovered and I've really grown as a teacher is taking kids at one level where these kids have this set of skills. That's not all there is to the kid and so we've been able to see kids grow and ourselves our view of the students grow. What I've learned as a teacher by participating in Pathways is that you can teach an old dog new tricks. I have learned how to teach in different ways and it has affected not only the way I teach with the students in our Pathways program but it has also changed the way that I teach traditional classroom. The community nights where um, our courses uh, at the end of each semester they culminate in this type of evening where we invite members from the local community and especially parents to come and see the work that their children have done. This is a different kind of class. We're not inviting inviting them to come see their SOL scores or their report cards. We're asking them to come and see the projects that their students have worked together, together with each other on. The project that I'm demonstrating today was we had to read Lord of the Flies this semester and we had to compare it to a global conflict that we were assigned and I did the um, Civil War in Syria and I thought it, it was quite interesting trying to compare things that happened in that uh, conflict 
to a book that was written way before the conflict even started. The project that I am presenting at the Community Night is my first semester humanities project and it's about the environment. What it is, is that we are discussing what's causing the pollution and what we can do to fix it and how it's affecting the ozone layer and all the animals in our ecosystem. We give some examples of how it can be fixed, of ways that people, not just across the country, but people in our own neighborhoods can fix. All these project nights are very good to see that how the students, how they're excelling and how they're thinking outside of the box. I, I think that is a, a good idea in explaining what they're learning in class. My daughter has done so many things in her freshman year that we did not know were possible. Uh, she has gone into physics, she has touched into English, she's taken trigonometry, she has advanced her studies not only from the freshman level but also from the sophomore level. Um, my daughter has ambitions to, to go into um, to graduate early now and it's this Pathways has given her that opportunity. I love teaching the Pathways program. Um, I love being able to use creativity and allow students, like not only do I get to use creativity to help students with their projects, but I feel like students get to just like shine with these projects and really put in like an individual turn on things and I just think that that is such a cool thing that students get to accomplish. I would do it again and again. Um, and the most rewarding thing has been seeing students learn, um, learn to learn in a different way and take on different roles and responsibilities and break out of their comfort zones. And I absolutely believe this first year of Pathways has been um, an overwhelming success. And while uh, those of us who are directly involved with uh, the Pathways project this year feel it was an overwhelming success, uh, part of the pilot, we uh, partnered with William & Mary to complete uh, a report and evaluation of the actual project. So I'd like to welcome tonight Dr. Mark Hofer and Dr. Lindy Johnson uh, from William & Mary to present uh, some of the, uh, the highlights of their research study report. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board and Dr. Heron. My name is Mark Hofer and I'm here with my colleague Lindy Johnson um, and we're representing the work that a team of researchers at William & Mary have, have undertaken this year uh, including Professor Jason Chen and Professor Meredith Keir and a team of doctoral students as well. One of the interesting but still challenging aspects of doing this evaluation study was the kinds of experiences that you heard from the students and from the parents that this program was designed around, around personalization, planning for what's next for them when they graduate from high school, uh, being involved in project-based learning, inquiry-based learning. These are not the kinds of skills that are easily measured by typical research instruments. It's hard to look at an SOL score and determine the degree to which that student's uh, experience autonomy and personalization of learning, or the uh, absenteeism, a direct correlation with their engagement in school. So we designed a program that we think captured the first year experience but we're also cognizant that a lot of these skills develop over time and build over time. So we're hopeful that we can continue this evaluation in more of a longitudinal framework, not just to look at the next cohort of students coming through the program, but also to follow this first year cohort as they, as they move through the program. So we're gonna share just, y'all got a, a copy of the report that's a lot more depth than we can go into tonight, but we're gonna give you sort of high level ideas. So we're gonna present on three different areas. Um, Primarily, we focus on student engagement as a, as a big indicator because, as Lindy, the way we operationalize it really connects with the goals of the program. But we're also going to look at the career identity and development process because that's a really unique aspect of Pathways. And then finally, we're going to look at the blended learning piece, which is probably the most innovative part of the program on the, for the, both teachers and students. So we're going to offer just a quick sets of findings and recommendations from that. So we started, um, we, as Mark mentioned, we really were 
challenge thinking about how, how we measure um, what's going on in pathways. And so we looked at the concept of student engagement. And overall, this is a graph nationally of how engaged students are in school by grade. And you can see, actually, that, that the way the chart goes is that kids, you know, five-year-olds in kindergarten are really engaged and really excited about their learning. And then in, throughout elementary school, they're pretty engaged in fifth grade. And then they hit middle school, and things start going down pretty dramatically. And then by ninth grade, 40, only 41% um, of students are, are engaged in their learning. Um, and so that's really, that, that was a, a main concern of, of the grant and the, one of the primary reasons for um, writing the grant. So when we talk about um, engagement, thank you, um, there are three kind of key aspects of engagement that, that make a student want to be interested in their academic work. And so that's autonomy or having choice, having a feeling that you can master content, and feeling connected to your, to your peers and to your teachers. OK, so um, there's a lot going on in this chart, and so I want to just kind of break it down for you. When we talk about engagement, the way that we conceptualized it um, for research purposes, are there kind of three aspects of engagement? There's be behavioral engagement, and that means how much a student is engaged with the academic content. Okay, so that's right down. Do I have a pointer on this? Maybe. Oh, do you have one? Can I borrow that? Um, so, thank you. Okay, so there's behavioral. Uh, so that's kids, how engaged kids are with the academic content. Emotional, that's how much kids are interested or how much they like school, okay? And then cognitive, that's how much they feel um, cared, wait, cared about, sorry. Um, so what, they did, what we did is we surveyed all of the students and we found that they kind of fell into these six categories, okay? And you can see over here, the participants, these are the, this is the biggest group of kids, so 30 kids, they follow the rules, but they feel a little bit detached, okay? Um, we also found that there are the achievers, these are kids who have high engagement and they all around have total buy-in. Um, the doers follow rules, but they have lower buy-in, and then we have a, a few kids, nine, who are resistors, so they feel, a, they feel low engagement all around, so those are the kids right here. The really key piece to remember about this is that, that this is the national average of engagement for kids right here, okay? And these are where the Pathways kids are with their engagement. Overall, 90% of kids in Pathways were really engaged in their learning. So are these numbers percentages or are these number of kids? I guess if you have 100 kids, it's the same, right? So, right. Right, so these are the num these are the number of kids. We didn't have a hundred percent return rate, right? Gotcha. Yeah, so it's voluntary. So these are the numbers of the numbers of kids. Yeah. Um, since this was a program where everyone's signing up to do it, mm -hmm. are the resistors the ones whose parents signed them up? I mean, like, who, who right? Are the so, resistors? well, one of the things that we know. So we also. Um, interviewed kids and held focus groups. And some of the reasons that kids signed up for Pathways is because the traditional school was not working for them. And so the way that Dr. Carroll actually kind of presented Pathways was this was an alternative for kids who traditional school was not working for them. So that might be kids who are high flyers and want to go really fast and graduate early. But there were also kids who, you know, we talked to kids who said, I failed every single class in middle school. Um, and so I wanted to come to Pathways to try something different. So we, so our sense is that some of these are resistors were kids who were just traditionally very um, uninvested um, in in their schooling. Did Dr. Did, did the resistors make up the? I noticed that there were 17 students who dropped out of the program. Were they part of that group? Some of those were part of that group. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so were they? put in their categories, I, I know that sounds awful, but were they put in their categories in the beginning of the year, at the end of the year? So we looked at, we um, surveyed the students at the beginning, middle, and end of the year. Um, we did not, and then afterwards, at the very end, the researchers tried to identify patterns and tried to make sense of levels of engagement among students. And so then we, as researchers, created these patterns for students. Because it, it would be interesting to know general population and have a control group because 
first day freshman year high school is different than last day freshman year high school yeah. and you know the first day you're like oh my god and, and you kind of get it down by the by the end so it's just kind of interesting to have that have that control group if we well and we actually surveyed the traditional ninth graders but we had such a low return rate that we couldn't make the comparison so we try yeah, we did actually did try to have the control group but it's it turns out that's very difficult getting surveys back from 14 year olds <laughs> it's hard to get surveys back from anybody yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to do anything with so, but just want to point out, <laughs> right, right. So, just want to point out again that the, regardless of these kind of different profiles, overall, kids and pathways were far more engaged than than the national average. Um, so, just in terms of recommendations overall, um, we we think it's important to. So, we looked at student engagement. We think it's important to look at other outcomes moving forward. So, we think it might be interesting to, for example, look at. Um, other kinds of, of measures, whether that be um, SAT scores moving on or um, acceptance to college, um, students' ability to find you know, meaningful work after graduation, but we're really not going to be able to understand that for a few more years. We also found that over the course of the year, it's really important to provide supports for students and teachers in navigating group work. One of the, the things, and I think you saw the, the teachers speak to this, Jackie Chisholm, for example, talked about the importance of teaching kids collaboration. When the, a lot of, we found that when the kids came up through middle school, they were very used to sitting back and letting the teacher give them all the information. And so suddenly when they had this freedom, they weren't really sure what to do with that. And so that kind of builds into this next point around increased student autonomy. Helping kids learn how to manage things on their own and become independent is a real process that takes time. And then this idea around increasing meaningfulness and relevancy, mo the vast majority of kids felt that these projects were absolutely meaningful and relevant to their lives. We did find in some of the classes, the blended classes especially, the large class sizes did affect some students' ability to make that meaningful connection with their teacher. And they felt like they wanted more one-on-one -on -one time with their teacher. And because of um, resources, that sometimes pre presented some, some challenges there. What does that more supports look like? Teachers and students. What is, what, in your so, view, what, in our view, we do think that teachers need um, continued professional development on how to manage and support collaborative work. Um, the scaffolding that needs to go into that, teachers don't always have the, that skill set, especially teachers who come through the NCLB, um, no child left, you know, no child left behind, where it's very kind of test driven. This requires a lot more practice, and so um, professional development for teachers, and then. With that, they'll be able to kind of bring that into and, and bring that to their students. But we also found, and, and this wasn't an aspect of the study, but we found such growth in the teachers in the Pathways program. We saw them really taking leadership roles and um, learning and getting so excited about kind of their own professional development and they're bringing their own creativity to the classroom. And we thought that that was just so powerful in a time when there is a teacher shortage in Virginia and teachers often feel, um, you know, demoralized and not supported and to see how excited and engaged the teachers were, were was really important we thought as well so in your view that's really professional development as opposed to bringing in you know team building facilitators or you know or more warm more professionals or both well I think I think it's professional development we know a lot about how to scaffold um, collaboration with kids um, and so there are specific things that that we know how to do and help teachers figure out how to do that yeah I mean, I thought I thought you know in the video they're teaching the old dog the new trick, right? The, yeah. You know, the, you could see the, the the more experienced teachers being reinvigorated about what their profession was about, and I think that's that's really a, a benefit to the program. You know, what it does to the kids, I mean, great and right. it's wonderful, but you know, what it, what it does for the teachers, I think, is is also really uh, outstanding. Yeah, I mean, to see Jackie Chisholm say, you know, I just want to teach in Pathways forever. That's what we want every teacher to say about their their profession and their careers that right. they you know that they're excited about it. So, um, we're going to move on a little and talk about student I identity and careers. So the next two pieces are those aspects of pathways I think that were particularly unique uh, to our uh, innovation grant proposal, and one of that is to help students. I, I remember distinctly one of the first meetings with Dr. Carroll. He said, you know, when the student comes across at graduation, walks across the stage, and I shake their hand. 
I want to know that they have a sense for what's next for them. I want them to have a plan. I want them to know where they're going, whether that's college or straight into the workforce or training, whatever the, whatever the course may be. So that was part of the, one of the major goals of this program. So what we did to take a look at this is we did inter interviews with 10 students uh, multiple times during the year to try to get a sense of how their understanding of themselves and what their future goals were, uh, both in their learning and beyond. And these were kids that were sort of strategically selected different levels of engagement, different levels of achievement. So this is a, a good sort of cross-section of kids to try to understand broadly you know, what, what's occurring so far in year one. So one of the things that they often talked about, these 10 students, is just about the autonomy piece. That they really, they were cognizant of the fact that they had more control over their learning, they had more choice, they had more ability to personalize, and they, they thought that they probably had that to a much greater degree than their classmates that weren't in the Pathways program. And especially that pace setting was really important to them. They were also very cognizant of the fact that they were developing skills that they might not otherwise be developing. So self-regulation, time management, um, the, the collaboration, that's a theme you'll see again even in the blended learning piece. That was something that was really top of mind for the students. And as 14-year-olds, that's encouraging to, that they're being that reflective, I think, with their learning. Uh, the last one, you know, they, they also recognize the idea that because they were able to do some of those assessments like the, rather than doing the SOL at the end of the English course, or at the end of the um, uh, world history course, they did that project where they took that uh, Lord of the Flies and compared it to a conflict, a modern day conflict. They realized how much more authentic a learning experience that was for them than answering questions on a test. So they, they were very, noted that definitely. A um, lot of focus, again, on the group work recognizing that you know they still have a ways to go that this is something that as adults we struggle sometimes to work collaboratively in teams particularly when there are people that we don't necessarily agree with or have a similar perspective so we're, we're with them in that um, and also the fact that they recognize the fact that they may not be learning more content than their counterparts in the traditional classes but they learn the content in a way that helped them build skills that they thought would be valuable for them in the future in their careers and so forth so in terms of recommendations here, we recognize that, again, building on the engagement piece, you're going to hear this again in blended learning, that's support for teamwork, collaboration. That's really, we think, a, a, an important piece. Not to say they didn't make great strides over the course of this year, but we think that we can be more methodical and more strategic about that. Um, and the time management in particular was a challenge for many 14-year-olds, I would assume, but especially with this group, so more support there. Um, Problem solving some of the technical issues, that was something that they increased their confidence greatly from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, but recognizing that there may need to be some more support there. And as Dr. Carroll noted, they've begun that advisory process where they're looking at different career possibilities and so forth, but they, and they realized they were just at the beginning of that journey, but they indicated that they were really interested to learn more what some of those possibilities were, uh, especially for those students that were planning on trying to graduate early. You know, so they, they wanted to get to that. So that's definitely something to, um, I know that's on, uh, on the mind of everyone moving forward, but building out those parts of the program strategically. Yes. Um, so for some of the teamwork collaboration, I was looking at kind of your breakdown of the student body, and you really have a big variance yes. of gifted and uh, kids that uh, are receiving special ed services. So I'm just am wondering, are the teams balanced in that respect? I mean, are, there, how has that been a challenge? It's definitely more mixed grouping, which I think is what we would all argue is probably the best case scenario. And that was actually a really, I'm glad you pointed that out because that was a really interesting finding from the first set of interviews to the last was that came up a lot in the first set of interviews. I'm tired of working with kids that aren't motivated, that aren't as invested as I am. Towards the end, they started to see that different people had different things to bring to that process and they were cognizant of the fact that they had better skills to manage those inevitable conflicts when, when folks work together. So definitely seeing some growth in that area. But I think even, even those students that had seen growth recognize that there's, there's, they can grow further. So last piece, and I'll, I'll try to be quick because I know we're, we're tough on time. The blended learning piece was probably the most innovative part of this program. It was the thing that was most new to teachers, most new to students. So the way we define blended learning in this program is in two different ways. The Pathways Math was really an asynchronous, individualized course based on 
the level of math that the students were ready for, Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2. The teacher was there to support kids as they had questions, but the kids worked independently through. They paced themselves through the curriculum. The blended English course was more of a project-based course, more similar to the Humanities by Design course. So a different model, and so students did more collaborative work in that. So two very different models of blended learning, but uh, they both both offered some opportunities and challenges. So we did surveys in September uh, at the beginning, towards the beginning of the semester. Uh, at the end of the semester in January, we did a third one in the spring, but we had the same problem with return rates, so we're not going to include those responses here. But uh, we definitely saw some positive findings. Uh, one of the key things with any kind of online learning is the student's commitment to the process because there, it is more autonomous, it is more on them to progress through the, and so we saw a, a significant increase in their commitment to being successful in the online course, and maybe more importantly is persisting. When they did run into troubles, whether it was technical difficulties, whether it was troubles with concepts from the content, um, they were more persistent and they had more confidence subsequently for mastering even difficult concepts in the online courses. So definitely saw some positive movement there, and again, it's the same theme. They really appreciated the autonomy that the that the blended learning provided for them. Very conscious of that all the time. Definitely some concerning findings here though as well. Uh, we saw a couple of dips um, in the, and they were slight, they weren't statistically significant, but they were less sure how practical the content was that they were learning in the course to sort of uh, applying that in different situations for what that's worth. Um, more importantly probably was the idea that uh, this was such a new experience for kids and having so much more responsibility for their own learning that at times they felt overwhelmed because sometimes kids get procrastinate, they get behind, so then they've got deadlines to meet and it's overwhelming. And in some cases there was just this blended learning, because they could move at their pace, there was always something more for them to do, which is a lot of what we experience in life after school, you know? <laughs> so they were getting a taste of the real world early, I guess. But, but that idea that um, th this was a big adjustment for them. And we definitely saw growth over time. I think if we were to look at this again next year, I think we'd see more confidence, more growth. But that said, I think there definitely are some recommendations. I think we need more training for students, both in terms of the, the technology, the platform in which they're learning, but also about how to self-regulate, manage their time, set goals, and so forth. Uh, in terms of the pacing and the feeling of overwhelm, we're pretty convinced the teachers towards the end of the year started implementing unit overviews where it kind of paced out the curriculum, gave them sort of a template for pacing. The students responded well to that. They, there's still freedom within those constraints, but at least it gave them some targets to shoot for. And I think that was helpful. And I think to do that for all of the units would be would be helpful. And then one of the, we, we had some just technical difficulties bringing the content in from the older uh, learning management system into the new one. And so some of the, the content didn't work correctly. Some of the assessments were not scoring appropriately. So I, I think as the year went on, a lot of those issues were, were worked through. But I think that's something to focus on as we move forward is thinking about, let's make sure that this is the best system for this process um, as we move forward. Question mark. Because um, that's a, uh, you know, two of those things um, are have been constant criticisms by, by high school students, right. regardless of, you know, when you're, in, when you're obviously in advanced courses, the amount of material, access to the teacher, the difficulty of the material, it's always going to be there. And um, so I'm kind of curious, do you think the technology part of it is, is going to, um, you know, make that uh, less cumbersome or, or less overwhelming or, or are they just going to always feel that way no, no matter what we do? I think it's a great, I mean, I think to some extent they're always going to feel that way. But I do think though that one of the things, specifically in the blended English course, the teacher uh, Ms. Anderson, she became so adept at working with small groups, pulling kids just as they needed help, giving them lots of feedback on their writing that they, that she said, I just can't do this in my traditional class. So the, I think is with more experience, I think that's going to get better. But I think you're right. I think that's always going to be a bit of an issue. Yeah. Question. I, the thing was here, you talked about the 17 students that dropped out. Um, during the, the first block, which was the humanities part, did most of those students succeed then? Was, was it when math was introduced that it became more difficult for them? That's a good question. I, I don't know, Dr. Carroll, if you can speak to this better than I. Um, I think that some of the students that left was for various reasons. You right. know, it wasn't necessarily just struggles, you know, uh, academically. 
Um, I don't know if I can give you a good answer for that. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I, I know when I would have dropped out. <laughs> 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 and that would have been it. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Hofer, is that your last slide? Uh, I think we've got one yeah. last, yeah. Yep. So just to kind of wrap up, um, these are the four objectives of the, of the Pathways pilot, um, to provide students with personalized learning, engage students in project-based learning, create relevant and student-centered approaches, and develop community workforce readiness through applied learning programs, internships, and relevant real-world experiences. So our sense of um, the grant is that they've, uh, uh, Warhill and Pathways have absolutely met each of these um, objectives. Number four, they are continuing to work to apply um, to create applied learning opportunities and internships for students. Um, but they are absolutely connecting kids to real world experiences. And I wanted to just read one last quote from a student because I think this sums up um, kind of what, what they've been able to do for kids. So this is one of the ninth graders who's reflecting on being in Pathways. And he said, after being in Pathways for a year, I feel kind of complete. I've always wanted to leave a lasting mark on my community and help solve large scale problems. And now that I actually got to communicate with one of the most powerful people in Virginia, it's when the Lieutenant Governor visited, I feel as if I am en route to leaving my mark. It won't stop there either as I will continue to try and make my community a better place. So I think if we can get all 14 year olds um, to feel that way, to feel like they can make a mark on their community, um, then that can be really powerful. So thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions. Dr. Carroll or Dr. Owen uh, Heron? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anything to add before we toss it to questions? Sorry. No, I just would like to, to thank our partners at William & Mary. You've been incredible this year, and we appreciate all the work that you've done. Thank you so much indeed for everything. And Madam Chair, just to, to wrap up, uh, to talk about next steps, uh, we're already working with the Warhill Pathways team to address and correct some of the identified issues with the feedback that we've gotten from uh, our William and Mary partners and also most importantly from our parents and students some of that you heard during the video. Um, we're going to continue with our year two of the Pathways pilot. Uh, we've been working uh, throughout the year to develop two, two new project-based courses. Uh, the Nature of Man, which is going to be a combination, again, the, the double block, co-taught English 11 and biology and man versus world, uh, world geography and probability and statistics. Uh, so it's not just the traditional pairing of social studies and English and science and math. Uh, and then we're, we will start our cohort two of Pathways Year One, and that's, again, an area uh, uh, where we'll continue to work with that next group of students to uh, address and, some, and continue to improve the pilot. I don't have questions, but do have a statement, feedback to share. So I attended the um, early college um, ceremony at Warhill in June and had an opportunity afterwards to chat with some of the students who were presenting. I guess that was the community night, and they shared their spring projects and engaged with a couple students who were totally engaged and were very excited about their learning. Um, talked with one student for probably 30 minutes. Um, about how she was able to knock out English 9 and 10 and high level math and physics and was so stoked for next year um, and is preparing to definitely do the early college program. So, I mean, the excitement um, with the speed at which she spoke to me, it was just, it was very exciting and heartwarming. And then she presented her project to me. So, it was wonderful. Dr. Beers? I'm, I, as I said, uh, when this whole thing began, that I thought this was a really um, exciting, innovative approach to, uh, you know, to instruction and, and the whole career orientation. But uh, I do, I really think um, that this is probably one of the best ways to um, generate motivation on the part of students, which is probably the single most, I, I think, especially uh, high school students, motivation and, and curiosity together. So I. Uh, no, I'm, um, I'm really. Yeah, I have to agree with Dr. Beers, what Dr. Beers said earlier about uh, high school students feeling overwhelmed and want more net, more of the teacher. I mean, that's probably not just a pathways issue. Okay. That's probably um, all of the, the high school the high school students there. Um, I did the Lord of the Flies, the Syrian Civil War. I thought was a really interesting project, and so I'd, I'd like to know how that 
how that goes. Um, so retention for sophomore year, uh, we had 100, had 17 drop out. Are, we, are, we, are all 83 coming back for sophomore year? or Yes. So that's the 17 that right. dropped out. And again, some of those numbers are uh, traditional high school turnover. So some of those students were um, moving moving, and you know, right. so things like that. So. Right. Got it. The, um, the other thing which I think is going to be interesting is some of these um, concerns, you know, overwhelm the direct support. It's going to be interesting to see how the sophomores mentor the freshmen um, to say, hey, you know, you got to get your butt in gear and get the stuff done. <laughs> and so you don't feel overwhelmed and just be interesting to see if that's, if there's um, any passing of knowledge on, on that level. Uh, I would hope so. We also, we've already, you know, in planning for the new two, the two new courses, We've had the same type of mentoring going on with current teachers and the additional staff that will be sure. adding into those new courses. Think a lot of lessons learned uh, from this year that uh, be sharing that knowledge. So I'm sure the same thing will happen with the students. And we and we did this as a pilot, and um, you know, one school to learn lessons so that we can go to the other two schools. And I and I think the some of the results that we're seeing here is going to really incentivize the other two schools to to really go in this direction and to to expand this program and take the lessons that were learned in the in at the Warhill pilot and move that to the other the two high schools. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. So thank you. I, I, I mean, this is fantastic. I, one of the things that, um, you know, we, we hear continually from the business community that we're not producing kids ready for the workforce. And uh, one of the things that came out there was that uh, helping students find a fulfilling job <laughs> other than working at McDonald's, which is okay if you want to do that. But feeling like that their life is of value and wanting to contribute, I think it's, it's opportunity galore, and I'm really impressed. So let's hope next year is just as successful. I'm looking forward already to the results, so I'll just keep it up. And our new principal over there has a – he's ready. I see him. <laughs> Dr. Hudson's more than ready. <laughs> Um, I just want to say the value of the teamwork and collaboration um, is so important. And regardless, especially if you're if you're heading on to college, uh, as someone who works with college students all the time and graduate students as well, you can't underestimate the power of having skills in a teamwork and collaborative environment. And a lot of our kids coming into college have never worked in a team, and it shows. I definitely agree as a former educator. I would always get the question, how does this relate to what I'm going to do in my life? And I think this is a perfect piece and, and way to mesh the real world in the classroom. So I appreciate hearing about this and look forward to seeing more. Um, I have a question that follows up on Mrs. Young's statement that she would drop out when the math was introduced. <laughs> um, so I see um, on this chart that there's several extensions in the math category. And so is that... Is, what, I don't so know. Those are uh, some of those. Uh, what we've discovered, and you know, to go to, uh, piggyback on Mr. Kelly's comment, uh, you have to remember the traditional high school issues and challenges didn't disappear with this group one of 100 students. So, in that cohort of 100, uh, we have students in there who have never passed a math SOL. Um, and traditionally, if you know, as we're moving forward, if you're a fr high school freshman taking algebra for the first time, you're, you struggle at mathematics. So this is an attempt to do something different than what has been done before. So what we've seen, those extensions are with some of our blended learning students from the spring semester. We've extended into, because they need time, they're able to master the content. Uh, so we've extended into the summer. Uh, and, and providing ways for them to get teacher support through the summer and continue with that um, because that's the, the ultimate goal behind the personalization is that whether you can finish it in nine days, nine weeks, or nine months, you're still able to successfully complete Algebra 1. And we want to help you do that. So it's like that kid and most likely to succeed that's Correct. Right. So That would be a, a perfect example of that. But we're seeing those. You know, again, the challenge is, especially with our Algebra 1 students. Um, and so that's something I, I'd say the Pathways Project, we haven't shied away from that challenge this year, and there's still much work to be done on that challenge. 
So when they start school in the fall, they will have hopefully completed that coursework. And Definitely. We're working to follow up on that. And then um, and with that, as we not to turn it into a math conversation, but part of the innovation that we've proposed with this project, um, if you're that struggling math student and I need three high school math credits to graduate, I've come in as a freshman, I've completed Algebra 1 in a blended environment, hopefully I've worked and successfully passed my SOL, so I've got my math verified credit. I just earned AFTA my second math credit as a freshman, so now I've got two of my three math credits at the end of my freshman year, and now I take um, man versus world with probability and statistics embedded. Theoretically, by the first semester of sophomore year, I have my three math credits, and that's not an impediment to high school graduation anymore. So if you're a struggling math student, that to me is one of the innovations as a, as a former high school principal, that, that's one of the, the biggest barriers to graduation. And that teaching two of those three math credits in context is going to help our students be more successful. What happens with the, it looks like you've got 30, 30 kids that got D's in physics by design and AFTA, and then over 20 that failed it. What happens to those those kids, do they repeat those classes or do they? Continue to work with them where, uh, and again, that's where the teachers are working. Some of them are, again, as in a traditional uh, classroom, sometimes it's struggling with the concepts. Uh, some of them are just didn't complete some of the assignments, and so working with them on that. Uh, um, I'm, I'm related to that. I'm curious about that. Suppose you do get a, a student who, you know, they, they keep working on working and they say, you know, this. Physics is not my thing. Um, I'd rather take biology. I'd rather take. How how how's the how's pathways um, deal with that, or can they deal with that? At this time, I don't know if I necessarily have a good answer for it as a as a pilot. But right. that's one of the reasons we or like in the yeah, future. Well, and that's why we've included biology for the for the second year. Okay. Um, because so he could again, just say, and they're going to need three different sciences, okay. whether you're passionate about biology, you're still going to need right. some other sciences to, to right. meet high school graduation requirements. Okay. Good. And I saw, uh, you know, your what next slide and what you're planning to do next year, but how about the evaluation component of that? Will that continue as well or? Um... Uh, we hope so. That's something to work with our, our partners and with uh, our, our funding stream. I think our biggest challenge is there, the money from the State Department was one year for implementation and it now will be zero next year. Right. But and and yet there's so much to do. And our, but our friends at William & Mary love this program, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Or any other questions? Any other comments? Uh, I'd just like to thank Dr. Carroll for his leadership of the implementation of this program. It, it gives me incredible hope for our students' future at high school to have an opportunity like this. And I know we'll have some interesting conversations when it comes to budget time because we all, everyone, <laughs> everyone around the table sees the incredible value in what's happening. So how do we make it happen and how do we give access to more students? But thank you again, our partners from William & Mary, uh, for all your work. And thank you, Jeff, for your incredible work as well. Thank you, Drs. Carol Hofer and Johnson. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. That brings us to item 7.02, review of CIP summer projects. No, no. No. You can't go. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Snipes is coming this evening to give you a very quick and brief update <laughs> on all of the CIP projects that have been completed during the last year. We haven't done this for a number of years, and I think it was time to give you and the community a quick overview with some pictures of the, the incredible work that's been done by the Department of Operations. Thank you, Mr. Snipes. Uh, again, I'll try to make this uh, really quick. We have a couple of slides to go through. Um, I'm here tonight along with Alan Robertson, who's our facilities manager, um, to, to answer any questions and to go through these projects. Each year, the uh, CIP committee meets to review suggested projects to include in the overall budget. Um, subsequently, the superintendent, the board, uh, uh, subsequently, the superintendent and staff develop and recommend a CIP. 
and the board uh, approves that CIP. So um, let's begin. Um, for fiscal year fiscal year 16, we requested that uh, we make some improvements to the Clarabur Baker parking lot, um, which was an additional 51 spaces. So um, if you can see here in this area right here where the pointer is, um, we've added some spaces um, here. In addition, uh, spaces were added here at the front of the school, um, which includes some handicap spaces, which were required by code. Uh, as well. Uh, the budget for that was $290,000 and the award came in at $269,500. Uh, during that same uh, summer, uh, Mr. A Mr. Robertson managed uh, this project as well. Um, we added uh, a roof replacement to the smaller section here at Clarabur Baker. Um, the budget for that was $93,000, um, came in at $68,917. Uh, Clever Baker uh, was a favorite project of ours last summer. Um, we did some refurbishment as well as some entrance uh, security um, design improvements there. Um, as you can see here, this entire area used to be uh, unfettered access, and I won't say unfettered where you just walk into the school, but if you could walk in here and you can turn to the right and you can go directly into the library without anyone seeing you. Now, if you see where this bench is, that's where the front door is. You can no longer go left because these doors are locked and on, the on this picture they're open, but they're usually locked. Um, and when you go this way, you cannot get through these doors unless the office buzzes you in. So now you have to be funneled through the office in order to get into the school. Um, that project, including refurbishment, um, the budget was $1,647,000, um, and it came in as $1,496,482. Colors added over there, Claire Bird Baker, were really nice. Yeah, just, we, um, we, uh, we discussed the, the colors. Alan, um, he's here to talk about that, we, uh, spoke with the principal at the time, and they came up with the color scheme. Um, this is pictures a little dark, you can't see it here, um, but this was uh, basically during the construction and this is a refurbishment and this is afterwards. Um, and many of our schools were going to rubberized tile and that rubberized tile um, is a lot more um, resilient. Um, it helps our custodial staff with not having to maintain floors and do stripping and whacking as much. And um, we've done it at Lafayette and we've done it at DJ, so we, we want to continue that. The color scheme was is good, especially for it's the elementary really school. Fun Yeah, it's uh, some, some some colors. Like I said, Mr. Robertson can can talk about those um, those areas. Um, as far as uh, entrance redesigns, um, they are in our CIP and are coming up in the next couple of years at all at many of our schools, and they will be at all of our schools. Um, uh, the James River uh, roof was uh, installed in 1993 and was beyond it was beyond its useful life. Um, there's no before and after picture because it's kind of difficult to see before and after um, from that amount. Uh, from Google, um, but the budget, <laughs> <laughs> the budget uh, for that was six hundred and forty-one thousand, and it came in at six hundred and thirty-six thousand. Uh, the same thing with the Jamestown roof. Um, the budget for that was eight fourteen four eighty-two, and it came in at seven hundred thirty-one thousand eight hundred. So many of these are coming in on the budget. Uh, along with the Jamestown roof, uh, we also had a refurbishment that was in year three. If you recall, back in 2013, I recall, we had the first year of the Jamestown refurbishment, which was locker rooms. The second year was the second floor, and the third year was the first floor. So as you can see uh, in this picture here, this is, um, this is during construction of the uh, cafeteria, and this is what it looked like afterwards. We also installed some, uh, the contract also installed it, logos and rubberized tile um, throughout that school. Um, the Jamestown tennis courts um, were an FY15, but the, as you as you are aware, the, the scope of work changed and then it and moved on to the FY16. Um, but there was some cracking involved. The tennis courts were 134,000, but the change in scope uh, the went to a co uh, collaborative contract with Centennial that uh, came in at 431,859 dollars. Uh, this was the tennis court during. Uh, kind of in the middle, and uh, the ribbon cutting and the ceremony there to open Jamestown Courts, um, and they are very happy with it at the present time. Uh, the Jamestown track also was a was prolonged a year, and it, the budget was 164485 
came in at 288,682 for Centennial contractors as well. I can tell you that this, uh, and Mr. Robertson can also tell you that there are many uh, organizations wanting to use the Jamestown track now because it is it's in such good condition. And the next slide, you'll see um, what it looks like now. It is it is pristine. It is it is a wonderful track um, to to for our for our students to use. Uh, as you're aware, the, the, the annex that we're in right now, but this is what the building did look like, um, with the uh, James Blair did look like before the demolition and renovation. Um, as I scroll through the slides, you'll see uh, part of the building coming down where the gym and the cafeteria were located. Um, now this part is gone. Um, you'll also see that we had added some additional parking as well as some crush and run for some parking as well. Um, so that was part of last year's um, summer projects as well. So as you can see, um, operations supported uh, many projects within the division. Um, the CIP committee is scheduled to meet again very soon, um, and so we will be um, planning to get the ball rolling again for next year. Um, uh, again, the renovations, as you can see, uh, if you live for the public to leave out of this building and go to the right, um, we've added ramps, ADA accessible um, flagpoles. There's now signs um, in this entire area has been uh, redone with security doors and entrances, as well as two restrooms as, as when you walk in through the front. Um, for this uh, summer, um, you'll notice uh, we are now uh, in the process of um, the Norwich HVAC, which is going along really well, uh, replacing some windows at Norwich, um, the roof replacement at Norwich. Um, the Lafayette roof design has come in, um, and we are in the process of starting the Lafayette Auxiliary Gym uh, and the walk-in freezer. Um, Stonehouse Chiller, DJ Cafeteria, and uh, black Backflow Preventers as well. So there are a multitude of items this summer that we are uh, taking care of and starting to uh, work on. So we just wanted you to be aware of those items and those projects that we've been working on and those that are coming up, um, as well as smaller projects like supporting Jeff with the, some, um, a small redesign of the um, Pathways room that he's been using for next year. Can, uh, can you remind us of the timeline for the Lafayette gym? Um, it is prepared to be open, uh, we're called June or July. Um, be finished finals completion in July of next uh, year, 2018, and be ready for occupancy on um, first day of school. So when, when, do we have break, when do we break ground over there? Mr. Robertson, do you have one answer to that? Later this month. Okay. Good. Thank you. Mr. Snipes, I have a question about um, the Jamestown track. I, I, I think, if I recall, some of the the, the reasons why it de decayed was because of the topography of the land, because it's essentially built on a swamp. So, in the refurbishment, were we able to mitigate that? Will Will we continue to have the same maintenance cost? Uh, you're correct, and no, we won't have them. A part of it included uh, tearing out a lot of what was there and regrading, especially on the two sides, uh, right above it and below it. Yes, uh, it, there was a problem with that, some washout, and that type of uh, track surface, if water sits on it and you get weeds coming through it, yeah, it can really mess it up. So, so we, we were able to mitigate that? Or yes. So it won't continue? Now, we have to keep an eye on it. We've talked with our ground staff. Matter of fact, one of the ground uh, staff, they had a training with uh, the people who installed it on how to maintain that track, how to make sure. And I think, frankly, they were more worried about weeds and grass and, uh, and, and the outside portion of the track than they were the water because what was happening is they just weren't uh, – we put rocks a little closer to the edge trying to mitigate some of the grass growing and some other kinds of things to, because that seemed to be what was killing the track even more so than the water getting on it. But we think that we've taken care of that, that it should, uh, it should be, but you got to keep it up. I mean, it's not something we ignore. Sure. Anything else? Will there be a groundbreaking ceremony for the auxiliary gym at Lafayette? Actually, so we <laughs> talked about it, but nothing no, is scheduled. scheduled. I would imagine that we will have some kind of a groundbreaking ceremony. That would be most now appropriate. Now we will. <laughs> I have to say yes, we yes. will. <laughs> it's photo. On a small scale. <laughs> Any other questions? I, I do want to thank Mr. Snipes and also uh, tell everybody that might be listening that another cool thing is 
you're a, you've got a bunch of carpenters and you've got a workroom and there's a whole lot that James City County, WJCC, does a lot of work for themselves to save a lot of money for the school system in small projects. Credit to Alan, he, ma he manages that with our, our, our carpenters and our electricians and plumbers, so he does a really good job with that. It's a good people. Thank you both. It's a lot to manage. Summer's a busy, busy time. So thank you. All right. There are no further questions. That moves us to action items. Um, 8.01 personnel actions. Can I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move approval of the personnel actions as presented this evening. I have a second. Second. Any discussion? No discussion. Ms. Thurza, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Motion passes. Item 8.02, release from compulsory attendance case number R17-07. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move that we approve release from compulsory attendance case number R17-07. Thank you, Mrs. Young. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Motion passes. 8.03, appoint a VSBA delegate and alternate delegate. Can I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move we appoint Mrs. Cook as the VSBA voting delegate and Mrs. Hummel as the alternate, alternate delegate. Second, please. Second. Second. Any discussion? Sir, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Thank you all, all of you for your support. Good luck. <laughs> um, 8.04, authorization of signatures in absence of the superintendent. May I have a motion, please? I move the author, uh, that we approve the authorization for Ms. Christina Berta, Chief Financial Officer, Dr. Jeffrey Carroll, Assistant Superintendent, Mr. Scott Thorpe, Assistant Superintendent to sign State Department of Education documents in the absence of the Superintendent through August 15, 2018. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. It's been uh, moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? No discussion. Will you call the roll, Ms. Sorza? Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Motion passes. <laughs> Item 8.05, tuition rates for non-resident students during the 2017-2018 school year. May I have a motion, please? I move to approve tuition rates for non-resident students for the 2017-2018 school year in the amount of 9832 for regular education and 17,895 for special education students. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Motion passes. Item 8.06, Revised Policy JN Appendix A, Student Fees for School Year 2017-2018. Can I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move that we approve the revised policy JN Appendix A student fee schedule. Zone B, is there a second? Excellent. Any discussion? All right, Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Motion passes as well. Item 8.0, I mean, I'm sorry, 8.07, approve a permanent utility easement to Dominion Energy at James Blair Middle School. May I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we adopt resolution R17-17, approving grant of permanent easement to Virginia Electric and Virginia Power Company, doing business as Dominion Energy, Virginia, and the right-of-way agreement, as presented this evening. Mr. Kelly, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ongby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. That passes as well. 
Item 8.08, .08, redistricting RFP. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move we award a contract for request for proposal number 1711637, redistricting service for WJCC School Division to cooperative strategies uh, to redistrict middle and high schools at a cost of 96,625. Is there a second? Second. second. <laughs> Can you record all those multiple seconds, please? Is there any discussion? We'd just like to thank uh, uh, Ms. Kitty for her help in uh, doing this RFP. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but she's a, she's a great, great resource and an asset to this county and the school division. Second. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, I agree. And I want to thank staff for their work on this. Um, you. Uh, uh, took in a lot of uh, information from a lot of different perspectives and distilled that to something that we can all agree on, which I think is really uh, wonderful. So thank you. Um, any further discussion before roll call? All right. Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, that brings us to 9.01 board members' comments. Um, Mrs. Young, do you have any? I just want to thank all of the cabinet and um, uh, Dr. Carroll and um, um, the other people who presented tonight for the information. And um, I'm looking forward to the start of the school year. I want to thank uh, Mr. Snipes very much for the report on the CIP. Thank you. It looks like it's going well. I appreciate your hard work. Um, uh, and again, just I'm grateful for our school district. It's a great school district. And welcome to all of our new people. Ellie? Finally, I get to go before Mrs. Owen B. <laughs> <laughs> she always goes to everything, right? Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, hope that our teachers are are enjoying their quote-unquote time off. I know a lot of them are doing professional development, uh, getting ready for the new school year, and um, recharging and re-energizing. And uh, I'd like to also add my uh, welcome to Mrs. Young for the new leadership and the new folks who, have, who are joining our school system. Uh, you have a high standard to meet. Uh, we are exceptional school division, and we expect our new leaders to be the same. So uh, we look forward to having you on board. and. Uh, and uh, we'll support you at, at this table as, as any way that we can and uh, appreciate you coming on board. Zombie. Mr. Kelly said it all. <laughs> <laughs> I too just wanted to welcome all the new folks. Um, glad that you're here and chose to um, be a part of the WJCC team and wanted to thank all of um, our community members who came and spoke tonight and shared their perspective and feedback on what's important as we begin to undertake uh, the mammoth task of redistricting and encourage the community to continue to stay involved um, through this process, which I am um, um, sure will be very transparent, but we definitely will need to have continued dialogue and feedback. Thank you. Dr. Beers? Yeah, just really two things. Um, I, I want to thank, uh, once again, Dr. Carroll and his team and the team from William & Mary in uh, really bringing forward, uh, I think, a, a really innovative uh, approach to curriculum and instruction um, in that high school. And I look forward to its expansion um, when we, when we um, move beyond a pilot. Uh, the other thing I, I, I would also like to say is, um, in, in view of this new innovative instruction, um, I like to uh, thank um, uh, Mr. Sipes and Mr. Robertson and all of their crews for um, giving us the very best physical plants, places where the kind of learning that we're trying to promote takes place. We're, we're, this is, we have first class um, facilities here. I also want to welcome the new leadership and thank Kitty Hall for her um, assistance in uh, making this the best contract that we, we can uh, have for us. I want to thank all of the community people who came out and spoke on behalf of um, the criteria for redistricting. It uh, is very important to me that uh, we maintain a balanced school system that is a personal uh, of personal importance to me I think that we should have a school 
district that reflects our community as a whole. And I don't think anyone should be moving into our community and be told, stay away from the school, or this is the school you need to go to. I want people to move into our community and have a very, very difficult time finding the perfect neighborhood because there's so much choice out there and that the schools are not part of that criteria, that everything across the board, they should be well, uh, well assured that no matter what neighborhood they live in, they'll be going to a school that they're comfortable with their children attending. So uh, that's important to me and in developing the criteria, it will be a part uh, that I will be advocating for. Um, and that's a thanks for Pathways, too. That was a great presentation. Uh, it's not always easy uh, to show the areas of concern and the areas of improvement. And I think you were very, very transparent. And here are our challenges. But if you're not trying something new, then we're just not going to ever make any progress. So I appreciate your work in that. Just say ditto. <laughs> I mean, I think everybody said it all. Welcome to our new leaders, and, and thank you for community members who came out. It's always encouraging to see you and, and hear from you, and it's important to us, and we appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who presented this evening. I will actually just say ditto. Yeah. How about that? Um, so with that, are there any other comments before we move on to the next? Okay. Um, upcoming events. Uh, we have a poli uh, the policy committee meets on the 19th of July at 4 p.m. here in the annex in room 309. And then, um, and then our upcoming meetings, we have a closed session on August 1st at 6 p.m. here in uh, room 309 of the annex. And then uh, work session and action items following on August 1st at 6.30 um, as well. And then on the 15th of August, we have a closed session at 6 p.m. in the Stryker Center, followed by a regular meeting on the 15th at 6.30 also in the Stryker Center. So did I miss anything? Okay. So with that, I'll adjourn the meeting.